The last time I addressed a large audience, its members each had four hoofed feet. And unlike this one, so far anyway, they were rowdy and uncooperative. <laughs> this photo was taken by my father of Muskoxen in Greenland, called Umingnak, or the Bearded Ones, by Inuit who believed them to be their ancestors. These resilient ungulates with whom I grew up have survived since the Ice Age, which would make me a true elder, I guess. <laughs> I see in the herd a metaphor for much of what much of the experience we've shared through Bioneers and the necessity of joining forces to confront the dark adversaries that we must face together, circling with horns, facing outward to protect our young. As is true of many iconic species, Umingmak are facing extinction because of climate change and extractive industries to which the far north is especially vulnerable. It was suggested that I say a little about how a farmer from Vermont might end up in LA. Suffice it to say that I responded to the mysterious flow of destiny and was honored to begin work as director of the Jenna and Michael King Foundation during the UN Year of Soil. What Jenna considers to be among the, our most important endeavors is to support the research behind and promotion of, often through film, the rural and urban regenerative agriculture and compost, especially with regard to their ability to mitigate climate change and restore the health of human and non-human communities and living systems. For me personally, it has also been a fascinating journey into the science beneath my family's organic soil practices, the magical realm of mycorrhizae. I'm never quite sure how to pronounce that. <laughs> Amidst all the shiny, hard-tech solutions offered to draw down carbon from the atmosphere, it's been wonderful to learn through the seminal work of the Marine Carbon Project and its partners that one of the most elegant and effective solutions was first presented by Mother Nature 3.4 billion years ago, and that is photosynthesis. It is my very great honor to introduce two of the acknowledged leaders in the field of carbon farming and regenerative agriculture my friends and colleagues, John Wick and Calla Rose Ostrander. Revolutionary discoveries, beautiful in their simplicity, are through their efforts beginning to change and influence practices not only throughout California, but throughout the nation and the watching world. Should all embrace them, our children and grandchildren may yet have a chance to meet a muskox. Um, I, I just feel the need to recognize and acknowledge what we've just learned um, at the previous presentation. And it reminds me that I don't know what I don't know. And like you, I have a, a thirst and appetite to hear these truths. And um, what I'm excited to share with you guys today is, is things I've discovered. And um, first I have to make a, an embarrassing confession. I love concrete. I worked for a couple of decades in this area, building, uh, doing projects in the early 90s. I went to school to become a project manager, and I had this dream of working on very large projects, in, um, in particular the Three Gorges Dam in China. I thought that would be a very spectacular achievement for a career. Fortunately, life happened, and a wonderful thing happened. My wife became very successful. She created a bestseller children's book, Goodnight Gorilla, and then won the Caldecott Award. And then, as a family decision, we chose to put my energy and my enthusiasm into her career. Now, I have a large personal space, and that requires a bigger studio than we had, so we bought a barn. And this barn that we bought was on a ranch 20 minutes west of here in Nicasio, and we went about our work creating children's books with no regard to the ranch surrounding this barn. It's 540 acres of a coastal prairie system. And our approach to managing this landscape was to leave it alone. It was our assumption that nature would heal itself and we could create wilderness by basically just watching. But that didn't happen. 
And soon, over a few years, the system went into chaos. We had encroachment of weeds from uh, places other than here. The coyote brush took over the landscape. We had sudden oak death. And so being who I am, I, I looked to technology and equipment and started to try and manage the system as a construction guy. And everything I did made it worse. And so it was spinning out of control, and, and it was then that we actually sought professional help. And that came in the form of a PhD Wayne ecologist, Dr. Jeffrey Creek. Now, Jeff suggested that we learn what this system was. And that was a, um, a big education for me. These are leaky, juicy systems. They're not hardscapes like I'm used to. And it required a complete different approach. And so working with living systems required observation and a more benevolent participation. So we introduced intentional disruption in the form of an occasional grazing event, and we did very light touches on the landscape and started to see spectacular results. We started to actually see whole systems of native plants appearing on their own without planting a seed. This became really exciting to us. Dr. Creek got more and more excited because around 2006, 2007, there was more and more concern about the climate, the climate crisis. And it was Jeff's thinking that if in fact we were creating conditions for the deeper rooted native perennial plants to express themselves, through photosynthesis, we were probably increasing durable soil carbon that would be significant. And we needed a way to measure that. So around 2008, we were able to create the Marin Carbon Project and brought together scientists, policymakers, practitioners, advisors, and explored the question of the role of carbon in managed natural systems upon which we rely for food, fuel, fiber, and flora. And over the next 10 years, we've actually developed a new insight into these managed systems, and it's a very exciting time for us. We now know that through managing for carbon, we can actually increase the system capacity to hold even more carbon. And once you do it, the system on its own starts to do it on its own. We first experimented with compost, and by putting this beautiful biologically stable molecule, carbon, nitrogen, and life, on the soil, the soil knew exactly what to do with it. So by applying a thin dusting of compost once on our grazed rangeland system, it was like putting medicine on this poor soil and it quickly became healthy, and on its own, started to promote more plant growth, which sequestered more carbon, which held more water, which promoted more plant growth, and it goes on and on. We've measured for five years this ongoing self-feeding carbon sequestration phenomenon, and our computer modeling shows that a single application of compost one time will result in a ton of carbon from the atmosphere ending up in a stable form in the soil for 30 to 100 years. This is incredibly exciting. Now, there are, there are a lot of questions around that. Is there enough compost? What can we make compost from? And if you're familiar with the Project Drawdown list, number three is food waste. So we have a tremendous amount of resources available to us to make compost with. But our scaling challenge is um, important and, and quite a challenge. Um, and before I introduce Kelly Rose Ostrander, who's helping with that, I wanted to point out one thing. I took this picture that I'm seeing, but you're not. Oh, here. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Um, I put compost on this field 13 years ago, one time, and graze it for about eight hours once a year. I took this picture last Monday during the height of the wildfires to show that these deeper-rooted native perennials are green year-round. I've never watered this. There's evidence that California was green year-round and is fire-resistant. So I'm very excited about this. And I also know that the sheep that graze this kind of land produce wool like that's, this shirt is made of. One pound of this climate-beneficial wool removed six pounds of carbon from the atmosphere. So the more clothing I produce, this is organic cotton from Cape Valley, wool from a carbon farm, we can actually clothe ourselves and eat food and enjoy renewable fuel, all derived from restorative agriculture that removes more carbon from the atmosphere than is re-released. <laughs> so it's a nice, it's nice. Um, but our, our scaling challenge is, is really important, and that's actually taking this 10 years of science and demonstration 
to adoption. And so it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Kelly Rose Ostrander, who I met while she was at the City of San Francisco Department of Environment, who helped me understand how we could actually take this science and demonstration to scale. You're gonna stay up here. You're, you'll stay here. Okay. Um, do you guys ever have that day where you plan and plan for something and then you're like, I'm not gonna use my slides because that's the day I'm having. Um, I was so um, pleased to meet John and when we uh, talked about this presentation, we decided that we weren't gonna tell you all the science. We weren't gonna go into all the laws that we passed because we really wanted to share a personal story with you and about this evolution and what it takes to do what we're gonna all need to do. Um, I met John in the city and county of San Francisco, actually first over the phone. He called me up and I, I answered, I was the climate change coordinator, and he said, I've got this project and we're gonna graze cows and we're gonna reduce carbon and we're gonna sell carbon offsets. And I said, that's nice. Um, call me back when you have a protocol and you've proved additionality and you've got all these things. And um, five years later, he showed up in our office, thanks to our great colleague, Kevin Drew, who's somewhere in this audience today. And he said, uh, we've, we did the science. We, uh, we showed that the soil actually responds and sequesters carbon with a single application of compost because it makes the whole system healthier. We got a biogeochemist to do it. Here are the 12 papers. Here's a protocol. Here's our policy base. By the way, we're working with the USDA and the Natural Resource Conservation Service. And we're here because we need more compost. And I said, OK. <laughs> Um, and then I, I had a personal experience where I had just finished writing the city and county of San Francisco's climate strategy with a number of people who were a part of that project. And I went on a surfing trip and I um, dove into the ocean and I got a brain injury. Um, I couldn't read or write for about a year. And um, in that time period, I was about on the same wavelength as the trees. They were about my speed. You know, uh, and I sat on the back porch and I listened to the trees and I listened to the birds. And what I realized in that time was that so much has happening so much faster than we thought. It was my job every day to read the climate science, to recommend what we were going to do for policy. And while I was inside reading the climate science and recommending policy, the outside world had shifted faster than any of us had predicted. Um, this was the beginning of the drought. So the birds waited for the rain. In November, they all went quiet. They started to go inside, their little goodbye songs, and the rain never came. In December, and it was quiet, and the birds were quiet, and the rain never came. In January, the birds were quiet, and then the first magnolias started blooming. And the birds kind of were like, should we come out? Like, do we chart chirping? And they did, but their song wasn't happy, it was confused. And in this time period, I experienced such grief because the flowers had been forced to bloom without any water. And the birds were coming out not having had any rest. Uh, and at that point I realized, you know, this game we've gotta play it differently. I can't go sit down for eight hours a day in the office and look at my computer and say I'm working on climate change. Um, and <laughs> that's, that's not to say that we don't often have to sit on our computers because we do have to communicate with each other, but that um, I was witnessing a culture that just got up and got on the BART and got in the car and went and sat and got up and went back and sat and went to bed. And it was like, no, the world is changing now. And in that, we also have so much freedom. So what did I do with my freedom? I quit my job with my pension and my social security and all those really great things that you get when you work for the city and county of San Francisco and I went to work with John in the Marin Carbon Project. Um, best decision I've ever made. <laughs> and I love my colleagues at the city and county of San Francisco and we continue to work together and that's what I'm gonna talk about now. 
So what the Marin Carbon Project did, which was so phenomenal, is they created pieces that all fit together to form a working model. And instead of saying, we have a theory of change, and the theory of change looks like this, and now you have to account for carbon everywhere in the supply chain, thank you very much, Kyoto Protocol, and no thank you, because that's a point source pollutant, and carbon is not a pollutant. It's the fundamental building block of life on our planet, and it's an element, and it cycles. What they gave us was not a framework that we had to fit into to create a cap and trade or an offset, although they did create a protocol for offsets. What they gave us were pieces of a new working system. And what I saw was that through the Fibershed project, however many of you are familiar with Fibershed, wonderful, amazing work. Through Fibershed, through the work with these districts called resource conservation districts, people know what those are? Anybody? Yeah, I had worked in government for 10 years. I'd never heard of them. I was like, who are you? What are you doing here? So they're just out on the landscape. Theodore Roosevelt created them post Dust Bowl to solve for the Dust Bowl. So it turns out there's this great infrastructure all over the United States, and it's in the form of technical assistance to ranchers and farmers on the ground. So they said, we're going to work with those guys, existing infrastructure. We're going to create and fund fiber shed to create regional fiber economies. We're also going to create a model for compost at the dairy next door. So we're going to create our own compost. We're going to do the science. We're going to get the protocols right. And then we're going to take it to scale. When we talk about scale, we often think about little house, big house, right? Little module, big modules, many factories. What the Marine Carbon Project did is it gave us a working model for a fractal. It's something that's repeatable in multiple variations across multiple systems. And it was specifically designed for the United States, so I'm not gonna say it's going to work everywhere, but carbon works everywhere, so I'm pretty sure we can figure it out. So with this model, we were then able to go out and scale up to California. What did we do with a coalition of people? We passed the Healthy Soils Initiative, which is funding for carbon farming in the state of California. For those of you who are worried about it not being funded this year, it's because no legislator showed up and said, this is my priority. So your homework, if you live in California, please, is to call your legislator and tell them, this is a priority for us. Because when we show up, change happens. And we were able to get that program passed. We were able to pass the first bill on short-lived climate pollutants in the world that regulates methane and black carbon. Also a really amazing accomplish. We were able to pass maybe four other laws that regulate and help incentivize the compost market. We were able to create carbon farm planning projects with the help of the Carbon Cycle Institute and CalCan and the California RCDs and 33 districts in the state of California from northern to southern. So in three years, we took a working model and we scaled up to the state. It's pretty impressive. I, I have a question for you. Oh, it's your question. So during the Kyoto Protocol, when we didn't sign up for it as a nation, what was the response for, from the U.S. Council of Mayors? Oh, right. So John really loves cities, and so do I. So you all know that when the U.S. didn't ratify Kyoto, the mayors stepped up and said, we're going to do this ourselves. And that's really where this action is at. The woman who spoke earlier on renewable energy, that's coming at the city level. You want composting, that's coming at the city or county level. So it really is these structures of power that we need to identify that we can utilize to create the change that we want to see in the world. And people will often ask, well, how do we create this huge problem? I mean, it's this huge problem. And what I learned by watching the Marin Carbon Project is they found out what worked, and then they kept supporting what worked. So oftentimes in our jobs or in our lives, we fight what's bad and we spend a lot of energy fighting what's bad. We have to find what works and support what works because where our attention goes, there our energy goes. So cities are one of those things that really work because they are responsive to people's power at the local level. And so for me, one of the big personal discoveries was in the beginning of the Marine Carbon Project, we were clearly told that anything we had to do, if the state and federal agencies were going to participate, everything we did had to be replicable, scalable, and broadly applicable. That, that made sense to me. I get it. Turns out, though, that that's the wrong approach. What I've discovered and what we've actually put to practice is first to scale something to the natural boundaries within which it's occurring and therefore replicated again 
within the natural boundaries, and that's how you broadly distribute something. So for me, local governance, the participation of us as citizens with our assemblymen, mayors, boards of supervisors, this is the scale with which we can actually change the world. This is our community. And working within our community with each other, we maybe can actually address this issue of otherness and... Um, yeah, we have to address it all the time. Yeah. I don't always like him, but it's hard not to like him, so we go back to it. I'm, I'm joking, but you know, and there are people in this audience, we spent people asking, how'd you guys get this done? It's so impressive, or what do we do next? And honestly, 80% of it is communication, right? We have to state what we need, we have to state what our goals are, we have to state what we share, and we will find out the things we don't share, and we will find out these things that maybe we have different in our needs, but I, I just, I want to say to everybody in this room, there's been such an incredible inspiring talks this whole week, but what I hope that you can take forward with you is something that the Dalai Lama once told me, which was this action starts at home. It starts with you, it starts with the people you interact with, and it starts with your community. And if we can't communicate with each other, if we can't say, this is my need, this is where I'm coming from, then we're never going to get there. And if we can't apologize, if it's about who's right instead of where are we going, we won't get there. And so this argument over like what's the right framework or what's the right way to do things, it's not the conversation to be having. People say, oh, so soil is the single thing that's gonna save the planet. We say, no, 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 you're missing it. How we exchange energy with each other in the form of carbon and how we use that energy is probably what's gonna help save all of us. So in this, in this time when this problem seems so overwhelming, just know that there's this beautiful solution, which is photosynthesis. It's built in everywhere around us, and the plants are giving us all energy that we can exchange with each other. And our job as humans in this role with the plant community is to give back, right? We have to give back to them. And that's why compost, I love it so much, is also one of these things that, you know, it's so simple, but it works so, so, so well. And so what we've discovered is that rather than competing for depleting resources from extractive approaches to things, that by managing for life and managing for the conditions for life to occur, we can actually create conditions that are self-feeding and create abundance. Where else can you do something where the more you do of it, the more resources you gain to do even more? Only with living systems. And so... As and I'd include people in that yeah, living system. So as much as I love concrete, I actually love life more. And I, <laughs> so thank you for your time. Thank you, guys.